Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. I know I'm not the only one still watching the political happenings of the day with complete disbelief. To get some focus of it, I've invited one of my favorite interpreters of politics and history to be my guest. Jonathan Alter is a journalist, best-selling author, and television producer. And he's also written three New York Times best-selling books about American presidents. Welcome. Thanks, Ronnie. So when you finish the Carter book, are you going <laughs> to write a, a book about Trump? <laughs> you know, uh, I will absolutely not write a book about Trump, uh, Trump himself uh, as a person. And the reason is books are hard to write, as any author knows. And you have to live with the person for a long time. Like I'm living with Jimmy Carter right now, and I lived with Barack Obama on the two books I wrote about him, and I lived with Franklin Roosevelt on the book I wrote about him. And I don't want to live with Donald Trump any more than I have to. <laughs> That's for my fair. job, my day job, you know, and for, for covering him and writing about him and, and talking about him on MSNBC, I have to stay up on what he does. It's possible that I might do a book on uh, how he wrecked part of the country. But it's not going to be it's not going to be a book so much about yes. him. It might be about something that he's done. Right. How he be, how he got to where no, he is. No, that it's, that how he got elected. People are writing books about that right now that'll come out this year. And I, I've got, you know, a lot a lot else on my plate. So that story will be covered. But the damage that he does as president, mm -hmm. it's quite possible that I'll, I'll write about that. It just won't be about him personally. Uh, mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, he gets enough attention as it is, mm -hmm. and there's something that's toxic about him. I don't think it's good for my health to spend too much time thinking totally. about him. But, you know, uh, looking at it now, and each day coming, things coming out about the, all the conflict of interests in him right. and the people he associates with and the, tw the tweets and all this stuff, that's between his election and certain thing. How, how, there's no way to stop him. There's no way to stop him. No, there, there? There, well, there's no way to stop him from becoming president. Yeah, that's what no, I mean. No, no, that, that, <laughs> that ship has sailed. Uh, and what but, happens once he's president, if he still doesn't give us any of the history of what his businesses are, if we don't know if he's detached? Well, he, so um, he will be at the end of this month in violation of the U.S. Constitution and uh, a uh, really subject to impeachment um, as a political matter. It wouldn't happen for a Who, long time, if ever. Who's ever going to impeach but him, just, right? I think this is something that people don't know. So, you know, mm -hmm. the Constitution uh, contains something called an emoluments clause. And an emolument is a gift or a financial relationship of one, a payment. <laughs> so by the end of this month, um, Donald Trump will be in violation of the U.S. Constitution, which I think is something that a lot of people don't really understand because it's a, it refers to a, an obscure clause in the Constitution called the Emoluments Clause. What is emoluments? An emolument is a payment or a gift, and, and um, the Constitution is extremely clear that no elected official is allowed to take any kind of emolument or gift from a foreign power and it says something in any circumstances whatsoever it's like very clear that you cannot take money from foreign powers and the way it's been interpreted over the years is that if they want to give you a gift when they're coming a foreign head of state is coming to visit the president that gift is okay as long as it's declared it belong the gift belongs to the US government not to the individual but this was to prevent foreign powers from buying our politicians. Um, no business relationships, no gifts, period. That's what the Constitution says. So there are foreign governments through what are called sovereign wealth funds that are in business with the Trump organization. Once Donald Trump deposits those checks in the Trump organization bank accounts at the end of the month when, you know, checks arrive, He's violated the U.S. Constitution. He's taken money from foreign governments for himself. He can't do that. Now, some people in both parties are beginning to talk about this. We'll see whether Trump sets up some kind of a, disassociates himself from his organization. Uh, I don't believe he's going to do that. Um, but, you know, give him a chance. Maybe he will. 
that's just one of many, many conflicts that will dog Trump and that will be the subject of all kinds of investigations moving forward. So obviously journalists have an important role in, in being vigilant, but I think citizens have an extremely important role and they, they can support investigative reporting by giving uh, to uh, you know, ProPublica, which, which subsidizes investigative reporting, or there's a new one called DC Report, uh, mm -hmm. where a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter is trying to get more resources, to subscribe to the New York Times and the Washington Post. Anything that's involved in holding him accountable, uh, not just for his personal business dealings, for his uh, playing poodle to Vladimir Putin, but for pretty much everything he does, we're going to have to become a vigilant okay. society. Stand every person watching this show has a role to play mm -hmm. in uh, enlist to resist, which is what I think uh, we're, we're going we, to We're going to call it. Uh, it do you think following this there'll ever be legislation that a candidate has to provide the, their income tax returns? No, certainly, well, I mean, if the Democrats, there might be yeah, someday if the later. Democrats uh, mm -hmm. get control. Yeah, that was a tradition, not a, a law. And not only did Donald Trump violate it when he was running for president, but he lied it now it. appears, well, he lied in that he said that he couldn't provide his taxes because of an audit, mm -hmm. which is just a flat out lie. Uh, there's no requirement that you uh, not, not disclose good. your taxes if you're under audit. Uh, but um, this, now this, this lack of transparency is spreading. So Rex Tillerson uh, is about to have his confirmation state hearings for, for mm -hmm. Secretary of State. And Bob Corker, the chairman mm -hmm. of the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, has said, oh, no, no, Mr. Tillerson doesn't need to release his taxes. Every other nominee for Secretary of State or other cabinet positions has done so in recent decades. And I, this is just some kind of deal that Corker uh, and cut what? with Trump. And, and uh, so all the other multimillionaires or billionaires <coughs> nominees don't have to do it either. Right. And Wilbur, because Wilbur, Wilbur Ross, who has all sorts of business connections, connections. Uh, including some that involve Russia, he, I don't know. I mean, we don't know yet whether um, Democrats will be able to convince enough Republicans uh, that they they need to vote to require I them mean, to release their taxes if they're going to be confirmed. Are we going to survive this? <laughs> we're going to survive this, Ronnie. We're going to survive it. I mean, remember how you felt when, uh, when Nixon became president, when Reagan became president. I, I do think this is worse I do too. than in those this situations. Far worse, I think. But look at the news we just had about Nixon. So he yes. basically violated the Logan the Act, you know, committed what is defined in some quarters as treason by, by you know, working with foreign powers before he was president to try to screw the then president, Lyndon Johnson, over uh, talks to end the Vietnam War because Nixon felt if the talks could be derailed, then he would be able to beat Hubert Humphrey in the 1968 election, as he did. He did, yeah. Um, so this, a lot of this is now coming out, some new information on this, on Nixon... Uh, the call, quote, throwing a monkey yeah. wrench into the 1968 election. Yeah. Very reminiscent of not just Watergate, but what happened with Trump and the Russians in this case. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of reporting to be done on that, a lot of investigation to be done on that. We do have some good news in that uh, John McCain is going to mm -hmm. investigate. Uh, Thank goodness uh, they don't the like Congress. Russia, right? And they don't like Russia, so we're <laughs> well, going we're we're to get more details more. on yeah. that. Um, but yeah, you have to I mean, we, we, will, we will survive as long as he doesn't get us into a nuclear war. And that's, that's you know, I always try to go, to go nuclear end. on these conversations. Like, will we survive if they cut taxes on rich people again? Mm -hmm. Of course. Mm -hmm. You know, will we survive if his taunts and belittling of people, uh, which is what got us into World War I, yeah. this kind of Kaiser Wilhelm yeah. behavior, Will we survive that? Deporting of people? Uh, I think that we will survive the deporting of people for uh, a couple of reasons. I, I do think there are a lot of Americans who will shelter uh, dreamers if they're facing deport mm -hmm. deportation. 
I know I would be willing to do that. And there are a lot of Americans of goodwill who will step forward. They're not going to be able to protect everybody from deportation. But I actually think on that, Trump won't follow through on the worst of what he said. And the deregulation uh, will be gradual enough that it can be changed later? So there's a lot of ways of stopping things. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was talking to somebody recently who was in the um, EPA under Jimmy Carter. Mm -hmm. And after Reagan was elected, they put in a woman uh, to run the EPA named Ann Gorsuch, who was just a slash and burn person. She was every bit as bad as the guy they've uh, got in now, this new guy, uh, Scott Pruitt, who will mm -hmm. be the new head of the EPA. She was trying to deregulate left and right, and there were a lot of ways that they could interfere. that they could prevent her from doing it. Now, did they prevent all damage to environmental regulation? No, but it was uh, it was not something uh, that they could mm -hmm. do to destroy the EPA. There are way, bureaucrats are very wily at protecting mm -hmm. their turf. They know a lot more about their agencies than the than political people who come right. in. You do Including have, the secretaries that are going to head the department. It's a lot easier to stop something than it is to get something done. And this is what the Republicans learned under, mm -hmm. under Obama. Obama. And I think now under Trump, the country's going to learn that the Democrats, even though you know, they do not have a, a majority in either House of Congress, they have other assets, other ways of gumming up the works and Let, preventing bad things from happening. Let's talk about the parties, because uh, the interesting thing was during the primary season, everybody said the Republican Party is in trouble, it's in disarray, et cetera, et cetera. I worry about the Democratic Party. I mean, I now, you know, we're waiting now for the Democratic National Committee to meet. So here I am, slightly up to date on politics and stuff. Yeah. I haven't got the faintest idea who represents the state on the Democratic National Committee. Yeah. And I fear it's going to be the same people who brought us to where we are now with the, the candidates, the way, you know, the whole thing. I don't, how do we affect that? What well, are we going to do about all, the Democratic Party? Um, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, <laughs> I interviewed President Obama briefly uh, not too long ago before the holiday. You know, he's going to get involved in, in party building uh, at the state and local level, uh, which is something that he unfortunately neglected yeah. when he was president. Uh, the likely new head of the Democratic National Committee is a very well-regarded guy who's the Secretary of mm -hmm. Labor now named Tom Perez. Mm -hmm. I spoke to him recently. He was talking about a 12-month effort, in other words, starting right away, not not just working some of the time on party building, but working all the time. It's a new way of saying 24-7, you yeah. know, to say 12-month effort. Uh -huh. and, and not just work before elections. There's a lot of work to be done. I think a lot of liberals have been complacent about this. Uh, they've been wringing their hands rather than getting involved in party building activities. They feel that somehow it's uh, beneath them or whatever to get involved in the you know, grubby work of, uh, of organizing. Uh, they don't want to get on the buses to go to battleground states. Maybe they did it when Obama was running, but they decided not to do it when Hillary was running. They, they need to establish connections. If they have, the thing is with, with the internet, here's a great thing about the internet. If you want to say, I want to get involved in party building in Pennsylvania, even though I live mm -hmm. in New York, you can do it. You can connect with the people who are trying to uh, improve the uh, Democratic Party's prospects in some of these rural counties, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and you can work with them. You can do it from afar. You can make calls from anywhere. Um, so there's a lots and lots of ways but, for people know, to get you involved. Have to, you almost have to go back to what it was like when the bosses controlled the party before you had the primaries, because each state had a strong party structure that existed throughout the tenure of a president or a congressman. I mean, they developed their own structures year round. So there 24, are, whatever there you are, said. There are, <laughs> there are still some pretty strong structures in various yeah. places. In other states, particularly red states, the state Democratic Party is, is not in good shape. In some places, it's a work in progress, like Texas, for instance, where the demographics mm -hmm. are starting to favor 
Democrats, there are a lot of people who are working to turn Texas blue by, you know, 2020 or 2024. Mm -hmm. It's a project. You know, George H.W. Bush helped turn it red. It used to be a totally right, blue, Democrat. Yeah. These things can be done. Politics is the art of the possible. What worries me about liberal Democrats is they're so demoralized and they don't understand all the different things they can do mm -hmm. and they wring their hands too much rather than rolling up their sleeves. So maybe we have uh, to wait until Trump does the first, I mean, he's already done things, but maybe it hasn't yet caused the ire to come and... Yeah, although, I mean, there are some hopeful signs yeah. of people getting motivated. So I recently attended a meeting of something called Blue Wave New Jersey, which is a, a grassroots organization of progressives who are involved in helping Democrats in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, and they did send many buses to Pennsylvania. Uh, are they for, developing for the their election. own talent, so they're going to have a good gubernatorial well, they, candidate? They, they are supporting, they support various candidates, and there were, I was expecting there would be like 100 mm -hmm. people there. There were like 800 mm -hmm. people there. People were really worried it's about the election, and they're really yeah. getting, they're going to get involved, yeah. and um, there's a lot of places to, to, uh, to help, but it reminds me a little when I said enlist to resist, which is the mm -hmm. phrase I like to use. I, I do think everybody has to make a commitment on what they're going to do. So if they're in journalism, you know, we have to say we're going to be vigilant. You're going to we're going to call him out if he's lying. We're not going to um, be intimidated by him. And if you're a political worker, you have to say, you know what? I'm going to give X amount, and I'm going to commit to doing it. Mm -hmm. I'm not just going to give it right now when I'm feeling really bad. You know, I'm going to make a commitment over the next four years, or possibly, I hate to say it, possibly eight years, to, to working on these, on these issues. And, and it reminds me of uh, my, my late father uh, flew a B-24 in World War II, and he was, you know, 19 years old at the time of Pearl Harbor. He would have preferred to have spent the next four years chasing girls, right? He didn't want to mm -hmm. go risk getting his but shot off and by Nazis, you know, when he was in his early 20s. And sp he spent the next four years at war. He didn't, but he signed up to serve because you don't choose at what time in your life you're called to serve. So I think all uh, Americans of goodwill who understand that this man is a menace to our, our constitution and our democracy, they're being called to serve now. You, the question is what way will each person you serve? You reminded me of the uh, old, you know, of the original old days of reform politics in New York City, the, the, the reformers against Sapia or the things. All these young veterans coming back from the war, that's how a movement started, basically. Right. And, uh, and you changed it. And you had parties. It, I, there's so much that's interfered with being able to develop national party that really means something. Television, the money. Right. Well, the Johnson uh, War on Poverty, which took away all the but a lot, social services they could do. Well, it's changed. I, I don't think I that, agree that really affected. I mean, I think that what happened is people got used to um, sort of tending their own garden and then voting for a good mm -hmm. candidate to save them for president, you know, and forgetting that it was a, really about them, not. And Obama tries to say this. It's not about me. It's about you. Yeah, right. Now, he could have helped a little more. He tried, but a lot of it was that people just, they kind of took it for granted. Okay, Obama's president now, you know, I'm on Miller time now. Yeah. And I think uh, older people started to feel, well, no, this is, this is for the next generation. And they forgot that older people have been involved in political movements for a long time. I mean, I, I remember at one point years ago covering something called the Gray Panthers. Yeah, right. You, you know, and they were sure. agitating for all kinds of <clears throat> legislation yeah. to help seniors and and older people vote more older people are why we have trump if you look at if you look at the mm -hmm. exit polls if you look at the breakdown it's these it's people over 50 who vote in greater numbers than younger people do and god knows why i mean they would have sent their kid away from the dinner table from saying the kind of for saying the kind of stuff that, that Trump said, not just about voted, women and they voted about other that. people they would have like slap you know yeah they would have slapped their child <laughs> How wash your mouth out with soap for yeah. saying this, for making fun of a handicapped person or whatever, and they vote for the guy. So I don't really get it, but you know I, I do think that that older people, really, if 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 
there were not as many older people in this country, Hillary would have won easily. She got killed among seniors. And, and so, you know, the, the, the question is, will, will older people who were not for Trump, will they say, you know what, we got to step up now and do our part to hold them accountable? Is, it, uh, is that what, you're, what people refer to, is the Democratic Party was too much with uh, the identity, you know, the separate groups of people uh, working there was, sort of against there each There was other. a little bit of a problem with the Democrats being too identified with identity politics mm -hmm. and not focused enough on economic mm -hmm. issues. I mean, you know, you've, you've been around for a lot of these elections. Going back to Franklin Roosevelt, the Democrats always closed their fall campaign on bread and butter, mm -hmm. lunch bucket, economic issues. And they didn't do that this time. And somehow they took their eye off the ball on the on the middle class and and so Trump comes along and he says uh, I think his his, uh, his best line was I love the poorly educated I mean there's a lot of people in this country who he loves everybody. who didn't finish <laughs> high school or didn't go to college right. if they did finish high school mm -hmm. and you know they're thinking this guy's got my back because the Democrats don't sound like they have my back you know you remember Bill Clinton would say I feel your pain, and people made fun of him for it, but he was saying, I hear you, I understand that things are not going so well for you out there in the middle part of the country. And Democrats tended to say, well, you know, we gotta do this for the LGBT community, we're gonna do this for African Americans, this for this group, and But they didn't, didn't really campaign didn't really, that way. You know, they didn't really campaign that way. Well, what happened was the campaign got hijacked onto questions about Donald Trump's right, they character. Right. That was so, and understand, I don't think Hillary made a mistake in right. focusing on right. what an awful person but he is. And she got aside. more votes than he yeah. did as a result of doing so. But she, she did lose a little bit of focus on saying what she would do. So she had all these programs if you went to her, uh, her website. Yeah. But most people didn't go to her website. and. You know, in the in the debates, she was, you know, arguing for the beauty queen that mm -hmm. Trump insulted, and I understand why she did. You know, mm -hmm. and that I, I, I'm sure that helped her get some votes, but yeah. she she needed to get back to these these bread and butter issues think, a little more. Don't you think did. also uh, the fact that he made such uh, gave su his money such a prominent role? He's a billionaire, and I'm going to take care of you. I mean, I believe that people think. If you're rich, you must be smart. And I think the appointments to the cabinet reflect that. He believes that if you make deals and you're smart right. and you've made the money, you know what to do. Right, so there were a couple of and things that I sort of happened. saw pretty early. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I didn't have a crystal ball that said Trump's yeah, gonna right, win. Right. And very early on, I didn't think he had a chance. But pretty quickly in 2015, I understood that there were two issues that really were helping him in a way that was not getting enough attention. One was that a lot of Americans believe, as you say, if you've got a lot of money, not only are you smart, but you're not corruptible because no, nobody's gonna buy you. So, and for a long time, one and of the things he played, lied about was he that said he was self-financed. That played yes, against Hillary. Yes, that played yeah. against Hillary. So who does she owe mm -hmm. to the foundation or where? And Trump, oh, he doesn't know anybody. He's, he's a yeah. billionaire. He's actually probably not a billionaire. Right. He wasn't self-financed. He did have PACs. You know, pretty much everything he says about that and a lot else is not true. But he created the impression that he was uncorruptible. We're going to find out he's going to run a very corrupt administration. That's very clear already for a lot of different reasons we can talk about. But, uh, you know, people were under the impression that he wasn't corruptible if they didn't pay too much attention to politics. And also, I think the political correctness was a very powerful issue. Americans were tired of walking yeah, around on tender it. hooks. Like, oh, I gotta tread carefully. If I say the wrong thing, my, my, my daughter-in-law you know, might get upset. Or you know, if I say the wrong thing, somebody in the supermarket. You know. And he played into that. Um, and, and I think a lot of even very progressive Americans are a little tired of being told. I am. That they I am. I know. I, be I hesitate before about I everything. say anything to be sure. Yeah. That's right. You know? Yeah. So he 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 used that very skillfully yeah. also. It's uh, so. What are we going to do? More than listening and listing and contributing and just um, arousing. I think you're right about the attendance at the meeting. 
some people in, in Manhattan, of course it's Manhattan, but the elected f officials have called meetings and they've had hundreds and hundreds of people yeah. coming. So one of the, I think, important messages that's come out recently is there's a group called Indivisible that's been created, uh, a former uh, you know, Democratic Party uh, aides on Capitol Hill, I think, started it. And their point is that what Democrats have to do now is imitate the Tea Party which I, I covered some in my, uh, my first Obama book, in The Promise, uh, the creation of the Tea Party, because almost immediately after Obama became president in, in early 2009, these Tea Party organizations, often unconnected to each other, popped up. It was mostly around tax day. And they, they got very upset with the stimulus and other uh, Obama ideas, mm -hmm. and they began organizing, and they showed up every time their member of Congress had a town meeting Speech. or appeared, they came mm -hmm. and they, now you don't want to imitate the worst parts of the Tea Party, certainly not, you don't want to adopt their views on policy, but and some of the, sometimes they would get physical, at, and we Democrats obviously should not do that, but just showing up to any time, if your congressman is there, you've you got to show up. You're perfectly right. And Listen, we're out of time. So will you come back again? Yeah, happy to. <laughs> I mean, you don't get an opportunity to talk so much, do you? Yeah, I'm happy. I'm always happy to talk to you. It's a great right. show. So you have to come back and help us, you know, help the, reader, the viewers see that there are things that they can do and what they can do, right? Yeah, be hopeful. Yes. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Ronnie. We at CUNY TV always like to hear from our viewers. So if you have any subjects you'd like to explore or people you'd like to hear, please let us know. Write to us at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or go to our website, cuny.tv, and click on Contact Us. We look forward to hearing from you.